Good morning. It's a joy to be with you today. It really is. It's amazing how God orchestrates our lives, isn't it? I'm sure you thought like I have, what an amazing divine orchestrator the Lord is. How he orchestrates our lives. And that's amazing to me. Um, there you go. All right. Everything all right? Look good? All right, everything's okay? All right. Oh, you did? Um, I think, never mind, I'm not going to go there. I was going to say something else, but I won't. Um, it's amazing to me. Uh, we look over our lives. 38 years in ministry, 38 years married, just a few days ago, and uh, we are always amazed at how God divinely orchestrates our lives, how he sets us up for good. That's the kind of God we serve. No matter what it feels like, no matter what it looks like, that's the kind of God we serve. You can always know that he is divinely working behind the scenes. Doesn't matter how you feel, doesn't matter what it looks like, doesn't matter what anybody says, uh, we have an almighty God. Look at all the names. Amen? Uh, we have we have someone who's watching over us and looking over us on a constant basis, and we're so grateful for that. So it's great to be here, honey. I know they know you already. Why don't you stand? Um, and it's a joy for us to be here. We know this is not by any means an accident or, or something man has planned. We know anytime we've come here, it's always been divine appointment, but even more so today. Uh, we love the healed family. There's just no getting around it. You can't get rid of us. Um, little, uh, you know, Italians just kind of stick on you. It's, just, uh, it's one of those things that we love relationships. We love people. When you get inside of our hearts, there's just no getting us out. And uh, we love you, Pastor John. We love you, Pastor Jenny. We really do. We care about you deeply. And, and uh, we love this church. We pray for this church. We surround you with faith and love. Uh, we cover you in our times of prayer as a church. Uh, we celebrate you, and uh, we really do. And uh, that's, those are not just empty pastor words that you say when you get up to speak in front of a people. Uh, truly, it means uh, the, the world to us and comes from a very sincere heart. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you today, there's several different things, but the first thing I want to say is um, in Acts 3 and 4, uh, you know that Peter and John uh, were at Gate Beautiful, uh, they're going into the temple, as you know, and they healed a lame man, didn't they? Uh, there at Gate Beautiful. And, and they were hassled for it, weren't they? They healed the lame man, and the authorities grabbed them and, and threatened them and hassled them. We know that's true. But what did they do? Uh, do you remember what they did when they were released? Tell me. They went where? I hear somebody saying it. They went to their own company. That's important. They went to their own company. They went to their own community. There's a word that's going around today, a, a new word called tribe. Everybody has a tribe. Not the Indians, wah, 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 but tribe, community, um, a people. Do you know you have a people? You didn't know that, did you? My people. You have a people. We all have a people. Look around. These are your people. It's interesting to me that they went to their people. The New King James Version says they went to their companions. They went to their community. They went to their company. Everybody has a company. Everybody needs to know who their company is. Amen. It's important in these last days. It's important when life throws all kind of curves at you that you know your company. When life, when the bottom of life falls out, when you're disappointed, when you're hurt, uh, when you're discouraged, when you're overwhelmed, when you doubt, when you don't know what the next turn is, it's important to do what the Bible says to do. The example that Peter and John gave us, they went to their own company. Notice they didn't scatter. They didn't judge. Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't do anything. They didn't say, well, you know, this or that. They went to their own company. And what did they do? They lifted up their voice and they prayed. Amen. They didn't gossip. They, they, they didn't judge. They prayed. And when they prayed, what happened? The place they were praying at shook. The presence of God showed up. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Great grace was upon them. Amen. That's why we're here today. Great grace was upon them. We are here today as having a family meeting here today. We're here today with our own company, with our own people, with our own group, with our own set of companions. Amen. And we are here today because we know that's what the Bible expects us to do. 
When we're hurt and disappointed and sick, we don't stay home. We go to church. We need each other. There's never been a time greater. We, we stress this at International Family Church more than ever, that we need each other. So there's so much at stake that we must come together, and we lift up our voices. And that's why we're here, to come together with our own people, with, with our own community, praise God, united as one, one heart, one mind, amen, and, and receive a fresh dose of great grace. How many can, can stand a little bit more of great grace? My definition of grace is power beyond your ability. Ever needed some power beyond your ability? Oh, yeah, all the time, even more so during difficult times, even more so. So today, that's why we're here. And I, I boldly declare that as a community, we're here with you as a people. You know, the Bible says when one mourns, we all mourn. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When light on the hill gets under attack, guess what? International Family Church is under attack. Right? We're, we're, we're one body. Amen. We're one of the same. And that's so important. And we come to reassure you and to say that to you in Jesus' name. Two important seasons. I want to introduce my words, my, my main subject today. This will be my introduction, what I'm about to say, to bring some context uh, to several important words that I have in my heart this morning. And there are two very important seasons that we all go through throughout our lives. And we'll go through these more than once. Uh, we'll go through these sometimes on a regular basis. The first season I call defining moments. Defining moments. Defining moments are moments where we experience extraordinary events. Listen very carefully. Extraordinary events that introduce yourself to yourself. Have you ever been introduced to yourself? That might sound strange to some of you. That might not make sense. But there are often times we go through life where life causes us to be introduced to ourselves in a whole nother way. You need to be introduced to yourself. You need to know yourself. You need to understand yourself. You need to know uh, about you and how you tick uh, during the good times, during the challenging times. Amen. And, and these it, moments usually come as a series of divine, excuse me, of difficult events that often take us by surprise and can shake us down to the very core of our foundation. I've learned, and so have you, that these events will either cause you to be a whiner with a loser's limp or create in you a fresh fight for a new second season that I call turning points. See, you can't have a turning point without a defining moment. We would love to have turning points, breakthroughs. We would love to have greater understanding in depth. We would love to have um, these times where God moves by his spirit in a great, fresh way. But you know what? The fact of life is that you're not going to have turning points until you are faithful to your defining moments. Amen. Can I hear an amen today? Defining moments do what it says. Defining moments define us. They define our character. They define the necessary adjustments we have to make to qualify for our turning points. Amen. First Samuel, young David, had some defining moments. They were called the lion and the bear, right? He faced the lion and the bear being faithful as he was guarding and watching and taking care of his father's sheep. The lion and the bear were for personally for him, for David. That was for his development. That was for his growth. That was for his defining moment as a man, the leader that was inside of him, to create in him an awareness of what he was able to do, what he was able to do. Only the lion and the bear, when those experiences come, do we realize the depth of what's on the inside of us. We don't face lions and bears every day, do we? No, but when we do, they introduce ourselves to ourselves. They tell us something about us. Do we run for the hills? Do we scream like a girl? What do we do? Amen. Um, do, we, do we stand our ground? Do we draw from the strength and inner fortitude that's on the inside of us? What do we do when these times come? Well, David slayed a lion and a bear. Pretty impressive. That was to develop him. That was for his leadership. That was for future preparation for his eventual turning point when he faced Goliath and then soon was anointed as king. Amen. 
You see, the lion and the bear were for David personally. Goliath was for a nation. But David couldn't affect the nation until he first got affected himself. Amen. See, there's so much at stake. We don't realize that when we go through defining moments, that we're, we, we see tunnel vision because tunnel vision gets us in a place to survive difficult moments. All we think about, how am I going to get through this? What about me? What about my family? What about my, my own skin? What about this and what about that? And, and we're, we, we have tunnel vision. But if we're not careful, we won't recognize the defining moment because oftentimes they surprise us. We didn't expect it. It was something that came out of left field. It was a choice we made. It was a choice somebody else made. It was, it, was, it was circumstances. It was things and events beyond our control that mushroomed and blew up in our face. And oftentimes they take us by surprise. And, and if we're not careful, we'll not recognize defining moments. So we'll blame God. We'll blame others. Uh, we'll not understand. We won't dig deep. We won't go further in God. We won't run to his word. See, defining moments require us to be faithful, require us to be patient, require us to have perseverance. Otherwise, we quit. We run. Otherwise, we blame God. We have an angry fist. What did I do to deserve this? And we're always asking the wrong question. We're saying why instead of saying what. When you're under attack, you don't say why. You say what. What do I do? What's your will? What's your plan? Don't waste your time asking why. Please. God's a good God. God's not going to give you something you can't handle. Now, I'm not suggesting everything that comes our way comes from God, obviously. But whether, whether, no matter where it comes from, we don't ask why. Don't waste your time whining. Can I be honest with you? We spend so much time whining in the church. Don't whine. Don't say why. Say what. Stand up, put your shoulders back. And, and, and understand what's going on here. David said, what's going on here with Goliath? What's the reward to the person who defeats this man? He wasn't saying, oh, why is this happening to me? Why did my dad send me just now? Why did I come with, with food for my brothers? Uh, why couldn't I be in the peaceful place of all the sheep? No, he didn't bother with all that. Something inside of him said, is there not a cause? He saw beyond what everybody else was hiding about and recognize this was a defining moment. While he didn't say it was a defining moment, we know in hindsight it was definitely a defining moment. What separates those who quit and give up and those who stand up tall and strong? There are several things I could say. One, I believe it's very key, is a word called courage. Courage. I want to spend our time today talking about this word courage. Amen. I believe it is courage that separates those who go through life whining with a loser's limp and those who have a testimony of the goodness of God. Courage will not tolerate a whiner with a loser's limp. Courage keeps us moving forward during our defining moments. See, courage is admired by all. Courage is something we all want. When we see it, man, we think, wow, look at that woman. Look at that man. Look at that family. Look at that church. Look at the courage they're, they're exhibiting. And we all admire that. We see it in history. We see it in our storybooks. We see it throughout history. It's in the movies. It's everywhere we go. We love going to the movies where we come out applauding and cheering because the underdog won. And he saw some courage. And we saw some fortitude. And he overcame odds that were against him. And, and, and we all celebrate that. From the cowardly lion in the Wizard of Oz to David battling Goliath, our soldiers fighting on the front lines, to social activists such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, to entrepreneurs such as Walt Disney and Steve Jobs. Amen. These examples are all around us. I'm sure if we took the time today, we'd have testimony after testimony of your courage. The Light on the Hill has testimony after testimony of folks that showed courage in the, in the, in the, in the understanding of tremendous difficulty in health and finances and single moms and single dads trying to provide for their family and, and overwhelming difficulties that, that came their way. We see this played out in the Bible from cover to cover. We see courage everywhere. Abraham left his home to journey to a place he wasn't even sure existed. Moses overcame his speech impediment to lead, lead the people of Israel to freedom. Joshua faced doubters who feared the promised land was too difficult to conquer. Gideon led an army 
of just 300 to defeat an army of thousands. Daniel and Esther displayed tremendous courage in the face of death. Nehemiah overcame fierce opposition to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. Jesus faced the cross and triumphed over death. Paul penned parts of the New Testament while nurturing wounds in prison. Examples of courage are all around us, inspiring us to never give up, to never back down, to always rise up, to always stand tall, to never whine and make an excuse and blame everybody else, but to stand up and believe that we serve an awesome, mighty God this morning. Amen. I love the words of Jesus in John 16, 33. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. John 16, 33, very familiar portion of Scripture, but one that is very appropriate for our today's discussion. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things, Jesus speaking here, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Listen, following Jesus does not mean you will never falter, that you will never fail, that you will never fear, but rather in the midst of those realities, we are able to take heart. Amen. We are able to rise up. See, the lives of great Christian leaders every day from historical to modern day to every one of us teach us that those who follow a God-sized dream must have a God-sized courage. Amen. They embody the psalmist's words in Psalm 31, 24. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. Amen. Do you hope in the Lord this morning? Do you hope in the Lord this morning? Then take courage. Be strong in Him. If you put your hope in the Lord, you can't help but be courageous. You can't help but trust Him. You put your hope in yourself. You put your hope in man. You put your hope in systems of, of government and other things. And, and oftentimes, they're going to let you down in a major way. It's so true. But I put my hope in the Lord. When we put our hope in the Lord, we will not be discouraged or defeated. We will not be let down. Glory to God. Amen. We will always rise up. Because, see, I understand something that most oftentimes, and you know this to be true, and you've discovered it to be true, that it takes great courage to go after God's plan. But when God's plan don't come during always easy seasons, they don't come when it's convenient. His word doesn't come to us when we want to hear it or our hearts are really ready to receive. But oftentimes his, his most impressive, deepest, most profound words come when we're discouraged. We're hiding in a cave. We want to run. We're in bed with the covers over our head with our favorite teddy bear with a quart of orange juice, and we don't want to leave. <laughs> right? We don't want to go. We don't want to get up in the morning. We don't, want to, we don't want to go to work. We don't want to go to church. Sunday morning, I want to sleep in today. We don't want, but oftentimes during those times, the most amazing words come to us when we don't think we have it, when we are at our wit's end, when we don't know what to do next, and we've come to the end of ourselves, finally. It's amazing the word of the Lord that comes to us during those most amazing times. I was at one of those times, and I was complaining to the Lord, and I can't remember now what I was complaining about, but I was in full mode complaining. I know none of you have ever done this, but I have, and I've been more than once. And during this one particular time, as I was complaining, I said to the Lord, it just doesn't seem fair. Why is it so hard? And I was complaining out and, and, and just not having a good season at all. One particular time, at a low point, the Lord said to me these words, the odds have always been against the righteous. The odds will always be against the righteous. Get over it. <laughs> Imagine he said that to me like that. I'm thinking it'd be nice now to make me feel loved, put your big arms around me, right? Uh, no, get over it. Why? Because I was making the storm the issue. And anytime you make the storm the issue, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. See, the odds will always be against the righteous. It's always been that way. 
from the beginning of time till now and, and, and until Jesus comes back, the odds will always be against us. We can whine about that, we can complain about that, or we can get a grip and recognize who lives on the inside of us. The greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. You know these great ocean liners, the ones who, who not only take people across the oceans, but oil and gas and supplies, how huge and large they are and well built they are. They go through some of the biggest storms through the Pacific or the Atlantic or wherever they might go, down to the south of Africa and around or whatever it might be. They face horrendous storms, storms we have never experienced in the natural like that. And they sail through. But the moment that storm gets in that great vessel, that vessel can begin to fall apart. Because the, the vessel wasn't designed for the storm to get on the inside of it. The vessel was designed to keep the storm out and to keep on moving. We are no different. We have not been designed to remain on the sunny, sandy shore. God called us to go into the deep. That's where the big fish are. That's where the big opportunities are. But the day we allow the storm to get inside of us is the day that we can count our days that we are going to be a casualty to that storm. Amen. And we must never allow that to be true. That's why if you're going to obey God, you need courage. Well, let's define courage. Wikipedia defines courage as the ability to confront fear in the face of pain, danger, uncertainty, and intimidation. That's good, isn't it? Courage as the ability to confront fear in the face of of pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. Courage is having the guts to do what needs to be done regardless of the fear we may feel or the questions that remain unanswered. When you walk in courage, you have endurance, firmness, fortitude to take a stand, to do what's right, no matter what the opposition you encounter says. In short, Courage is having the nerve to do what you know God's called you to do and to do it for the, at the, with the best of your ability and go after your dream with everything that's within you. Amen. See, without courage, your assignment is crippled. Courage produces the, the, the backdrop, the environment for greatness. There can't be cur greatness without courage. And, and there are many other words that we could put into this. This could be a whole series of words, but today the word in my heart, uh, in, by my, in, the, in my spirit, is courage. See, even when you have a crystal clear vision from God, and, and you know the path you should take, it will not help you in the least unless you also have courage to go along with it. Just because you have a clear sense of who you are, a clear sense of something on the horizon that you should be targeting for, just because you have a word from the Lord that this and this is what you're going to do in your lifetime or in this next season. That's great. Write it down. But without courage, it won't ever happen. Without courage, your first flat tire, you're going to quit. Without courage, the first opposition, the first person that says, that's not a good dream. That's who you think you are. You're going to let it go. And, and, but when you have courage in your heart, that flat tire encourages you. As flat as that tire is, you're thinking, glory to God, I'm in the right place. See, some of you would quit at the first flat tire. But if you really had a word from the Lord and you had courage in your heart, you'd realize, okay, devil, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to stop me, but it's not going to work. Amen. It's the difference between someone who has courage and someone who doesn't have courage. Someone with fortitude, someone who doesn't have fortitude. Someone with perseverance, with a made-up mind, and someone who does not have it. Courage moves us from ideals to action, from potential to actuality. You can dream all you want, but at some point you better wake up. Wake up from that dream. Start doing something about it. Amen. You can talk about your potential all day long. You can talk about your lofty ideals all day long. But at some point, we can't just say, ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim. Sometimes you got to pull the trigger and say what? Fire. Ready, set, grow. That's been our theme this year. That's been our, our mandate this year as a church. Ready, set, grow. We are taking on another level. We're taking a new step in God, praise God, with intentionality. We're going after 
God's highest and best. For a few more minutes, let me give you four insights concerning courage. Four things that I believe will help you define courage and thus recognize it, want it, desire it to be on the inside of you. Most likely, each one of you have a level and, 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 and part of courage in your life. Let's, let's stir it up. Let's uh, magnify it. Let it be something real and, and personal in your life today. Insight number one, courage is not waiting for your fear to go away. Did you get that? Courage is not waiting for your fear to go away. We know this um, at a gut level. Many times fear wants to hold us back, and oftentimes it does. Faith is usually connected to the uncertainty about the future. Excuse me, fear is usually connected to the uncertainty about your future. What's next? What's around the bend? What's going to happen because of this? What's going to happen because of that? We don't have the answers. We might not know specifics about what tomorrow holds, but we do know who holds tomorrow, don't we? We might not know what events are going to take place tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow. We know who is in charge of my tomorrow. We know who, I've, who we're putting our trust in tomorrow. So we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds my tomorrow. Uncertainty about the future is never going to go away. We'll never have a crystal ball. We'll never have an understanding of all totally of what our tomorrows might hold. It's not, it doesn't work that way. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. That's why we put our trust in God. That's why we wake up every morning and, and dedicate our morning to the Lord. We dedicate that morning to the Lord. Why? Because we don't know what the next 24 hours holds. That's why you come to church the first day of the week on Sunday morning. Why? You don't know what the rest of the six days are going to happen. Right? That's why we offer our first fruits to God. That's why we tithe. That's why we do the things we do. All these first, why? I don't know what the rest of my day is going to have. I don't know what the rest of my week is going to be like. I don't know what the rest of my uh, week and month are going to be like uh, with my finances and unexpected bills and, and, and situations that surprise me. I don't know that, but that's why I put first things first, because God must always be first. Amen. Now, courage is not waiting for your fear to go away. Whenever there's uncertainty, there'll always be a need for someone to rise up and say, it's okay, we don't know. But today we do. Tomorrow's nothing we can do about it. Yesterday, there's nothing we can do about it. Tomorrow takes care of itself, but faith only works for today. So we can't be blown away and all full of regret by yesterday. We can't be in dread, oh my, what's going to happen tomorrow? But we have to learn to discipline ourselves to work hard and strong and stand on God's word for today and every day. Amen? That's why I believe courage is one of the most important traits for a, a, a Christian, for a child of God, especially for a leader, what they can possess. Insight number two. Courage is not gender specific. It doesn't require an education, an age limit, or a resume. Let me say it again. Courage is not gender specific, and it doesn't require an education, an age limit, or a resume. What does that mean? Every one of us are capable of walking in great courage. You don't need a master's in divinity. You don't need 38 years of, of experience in ministry. Uh, you don't need to come from a certain family. You don't need to have a certain education or a certain amount of money in the bank. Aren't you glad? Everyone can walk in courage, from the youngest to the oldest. Every one of us can make the choice to walk in courage. Courage is the kind of virtue that, that without it, none of the other virtues become possible. The only, way to, the only way to courage is through fear, intimidation, obstacles, and frustration. Amen. See, courage needs a stage to perform on. Why do you need courage if you were fine? Why do you need courage if you have all the money that you need in the bank? Why would you need courage when everything about your life is perfect and everything's great and the sun is shining and the birds are singing and there's a south wind blowing and everybody's in love and all the bills are paid and everybody's happy? Do you need courage then? No. Why? It's not necessary. Courage needs a stage. Courage needs an environment. Courage needs an environment. And it's the environment none of us want. 
We don't sign up for frustration. We don't sign up for difficulty. We don't sign up for hard times. We don't sign up for uncertainty. We don't sign up for anxiety. But that's the time we need courage. Now we need courage. Today we need courage. There's never been a time when we need courage ever more with our society, the way it's going, and, and the church, and circumstances, and the economy, and, and all the on and on and on we can go today. Amen. Courage is necessary. Amen. And it is through fear that we're courageous. It's through intimidation that we're courageous. It's through obstacles that we are courageous. It's through our frustrations that we are courageous. Why would you pursue today what? Would you pursue today if you weren't afraid to fail? If you were certain God would back you up, what would you do? Then do it. Move forward requires a certain level of risk, and the possibility is always there that something challenging and difficult may stand in your way. Number three, courage is not inborn like some personality traits. It's learned. Courage is not inborn like some personality traits. It's, in, it's learned. The natural human's response when fear comes is what? Run. Flight. That's the natural response, the natural the defense system. When we're afraid or, or, or when we touch something hot or when we are facing danger, amen, it's, it's, it's natural for us to run uh, and, and, and what frightens us. But life's greatest breakthroughs happens, listen, when we resist that impulse. When we resist that impulse. The impulse of the natural, the human impulse is to run, is to hide, is to cringe, is to say, I can't, is to say, no way, I can't do that. There's no way I'm able to do that. Maybe Pastor John can do that, but, but, uh, but there's no way I can do that. And so we have to resist that impulse because courage is learned. Maybe you were, you were born with a bubbly personality. Maybe you were born with thinking quickly on your feet. Maybe you were born with a certain sense of humor, um, a certain sense of, of daring about you, a certain sense of adventure and adrenaline, adrenaline rush. Maybe, maybe that's natural to you because you were born that way. But not everybody is born that way. But, but everybody can learn courage. Isn't that good news today? Amen. Remember when you were a fearless kid? Man, you would jump in the deep end. You take the training wheels off and go for it, right? Amen. You'd get your hands away from the rail and begin to ice skate or roller skate all by yourself. Man, you, you, you remember those times when you did some crazy things and you probably got some scars. We can tell some stories today. Some skin knees and foreheads and missing teeth and, and so forth because fearlessness caused you to jump out there in a way that you thought, woo, this is not something somebody would normally do. See, we learn, we learn that prog we learn that progress requires courage. Anybody can stay comfortable. Anybody can stay in their comfort zone. Anybody can think they're doing great in their comfort zone. But they never reach their full potential. They never reach God's highest and best. They never reach beyond what is yet still to be exposed in their lives. Praise God. Number four, last but not least, courage is feeling fear, but choosing to act anyways. Mm. I'm not saying this is easy. Courage is feeling fear, but choosing to act anyways. Making a difference many times starts by simply making a move, taking a step. We can't live and lead in a state of fear and inactivity. Amen. We can't sit on the sidelines. I was never a sideline person. I was always in the arena, whatever sport I was playing, whatever I'm involved with, whatever situation. I, I like to be in the front lines, in the middle of it. I want to be in the front row. I, I want to be there and, and feel the spit come out of their mouth. Amen. I, 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 I want to be right there. I want to feel it. I want to know it. Um, that's where the greater rewards come. Anybody can sit in the sidelines and the grandstands and, and, and be a Monday morning quarterback, but Man, the best part about the Christian life is getting busy, rolling up your sleeves, right? Getting involved, being active as believers, as followers of Jesus. If we're not chasing something that's much bigger than we are, and there's no way we could ever accomplish it without God, then we're playing it too safe. By nature, divine assignments are impossible. That might not excite you. 
but it's true. By nature, a God dream is impossible. You can't do it by yourself. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough education. You don't have enough what it takes to fulfill a God dream. If you did, it wouldn't be a God dream. If you did, it wouldn't be a God assignment. Hallelujah. Here's what Nelson Mandela said. I've learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Man, that's good. That's a good word. The film Braveheart offers one of the greatest examples of courage in modern cinema. William Wallace so aptly reminds, men don't follow title, they follow courage. They follow courage. I want to follow courage. Who doesn't want to follow a, a, a leader of courage, a man, a woman of courage? Who doesn't want to follow? What teenager is not going to have a bunch of other teenagers following him if they have courage? They believe in courage for the right direction and courage for the right stuff. Amen. They have the wisdom to, to go after the right thing. Oftentimes in our youth, we are courageous about the wrong thing sometimes. We're on the wrong side, but we applaud the fact that they're courageous. We just got to keep training them to, to, to follow the right cause. Isn't that true? Every person makes that choice. You can sit in the mountaintop, enjoy the view, or you can take a fresh step into God's plan for your life. Mountaintops are great, but there's no oxygen up there. Amen. You got to get down sometimes in the nitty gritty, down in the valley, down where all the trees are, where the rich oxygen and, and life lives and life exists. In closing, one last word rose in my heart for you today. That's the word arise. Arise. Write that down. Arise. The word arise simply means get up and get going. That's a good word, don't you think? Yeah. You may be, that may be your answer you're looking for as you are facing difficulties, as you are facing challenges, as you are facing things that seem to stretch you beyond your comfort, beyond your ability, beyond your present knowledge, beyond your present wisdom, beyond your present ability. Amen. Thinking, what do I do next? How do I survive? How do I overcome? Well, God's answer to you may well be the same answer that many other people in the Bible had and needed when they experienced intimidation, confusion, and disappointment with life. Arise. For 40 years, Moses led the Israelites in the wilderness. These people were dependent upon him for four decades. They looked to him to take him to the promised land. They trusted him. They admired him. They thought, dear God, this man hears from heaven. This man is in the presence of God. This man, you know, s s sees a portion of God, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and, but he died before he could, they could get to the promised land. We know the story. The people were mourning. They were confused. There was uncertainty in the camp. So God spoke to Joshua, now their new leader. And he says to them in Joshua 1, 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. Interesting. Joshua and the people already knew that Moses was dead. So why did God say Moses is dead? Well, as I thought about that, I believe it was for emphasis. It was an emphatic statement to wake them up to the fact they had two choices and only two choices. They could sit there and die, or they could get up and get going. In their uncertainty, in their being overwhelmed, in their state of mourning, in their state of deep grief as a nation, the Lord knew that they had a choice to make. It was only two choices. And e either one would be a defining moment. Either one would be a moment that would be, at some point, a turning point, or one that there would be their demise for the rest of their lives. They could sit there and die and mourn about the fact that what just happened was true and was not going to be able to be changed. Or they could get up and get going. In John chapter 5, Jesus encountered a, a, a man who was crippled at the pool of Bethesda, waiting for a miracle. You know the story. He asked the man, how long have you been in this condition? The man replied, 38 years. Wow. Imagine being in a condition for 38 years. 
38 years, he was waiting for the waters to be troubled. 38 years, I don't have a man to take me. I don't have a man to carry me there. I, I, I have no way to get there when, when the angel comes and troubles the waters and everybody else gets killed before me. 38 years. What did Jesus say? Okay, well, keep on waiting. Maybe something good will happen. That's not what he said. John 5, 8. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. He said, Arise, get up and get going. Imagine that, 38 years stuck. 38 years stuck in that place. 38 years complaining. 38 years wondering when my time's going to come. 38 years waiting for something to happen, waiting for a break, waiting for his turn to come, waiting for, uh, uh, you know, the more he rubbed his rabbit's foot, the more he held on to that horseshoe, you know, the, the, the more he waited and waited and waited. 38 years he was stuck. How many times have we been knocked down by life? Poor choices, the devastating choice of others. God's word gives us clear instruction on what to do during those times and keep on doing it Micah 7, 8. When I fall, I shall arise. Amen? That's what we do. That's what we do. I know it sounds so simple, but really in reality, that's what we do. No matter what it is. No matter what we're going through. When we fall, and we will. When we blow it, and we do. When somebody else blows it, and they do. When circumstance happens, and they do. When, when this turns, and that turns, and it happens. So when I fall, not if I fall... When I fall, I shall arise. I get up. I stand up. I make a decision intentionally. Amen. It's not something automatic that just happens. I make the choice to arise. Somebody doesn't make it for me, right? God can't do it for me. When I arise, I do my part. God can do his part. But God can't do his part when I don't want to arise, when I don't get up and get going. How true that is today. We must make a choice to get up and get going, not be trapped by past fears and failures and disappointments and regrets. The days that I'm discouraged, the days that I'm overwhelmed, I turn to Isaiah 60, verse 1, in the Amplified Version. It says, Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Isn't that good? Man, thank God for his word today. I would write that down, please, and read it over and over and over. That's a refrigerator scripture. Amen. That's worthy of your bathroom mirror. Glory to God. Amen. All the promises given in that verse are predicated on the instruction to arise. If we refuse to arise, then God can't do his part. We'll never shine. We'll never rise up above our circumstances that have prostrated us or depressed us or caused us to keep us captive and bound. Decide today, are you giving up? Or are you getting up? I don't know about you, but every day I get up. And I get up with a song in my heart and a spring in my step no matter how I feel because I believe I serve an amazing God. It is easy to get up. It, excuse me. It is easy to give up. But those who are strong in the Lord, we don't give up. We keep on going. Amen. The days of playing it safe are behind us. The days of allowing intimidation are behind us. It's a day to be positive. It's a day to walk by faith. It's a day to be bold. It's a day to be entrepreneurial. Why? Because there's just so much at stake. There's too much at stake for the healed family. There's too much at stake for your family. There's too much at stake for this church. There's too much at stake for our children. There's too much at stake for our grandchildren, praise God. Today, be courageous and rise up. It's time to get up and get going. Your life unfolds in the proportion to your courage. I'm going to say that again. I wrote that down this morning, 4.30 in the morning. Your life unfolds in proportion to your courage. Wow. Much courage, man, much unfolds for you. Little courage, not much unfolds for you. It's going to take courage to take that next step. Every one of us have a step to take. That's what we've challenged our congregation this year. 
I wasn't asking our congregation right in the beginning of the year to do all these land outlandish things and big things. All I was saying, I said, no matter where you are, all I want you to do is this. Take a step. Any one of us can take a step. Everybody in this room today can take a step. Am I saying two steps, three steps, run a marathon? One step. Wherever you are today, take a step. Whatever level of maturity you are, take a step. Whatever place of fear you are, take a step. Verna, the Lord spoke to Verna many years ago in the beginning of our ministry and stuck with this, us for all these years. For 32 years, the Lord said to us, small adjustments bring radical change. What small adjustment can you make today? A small adjustment will bring radical change. What is in you that we don't know about? What is in you that we don't know about? What is in you that we haven't discovered yet? What is in you that you haven't manifested yet? What is in you you're afraid to say yes to? What is in you that you're afraid to take it to that next level? What's in you that you've been struggling with? What is that thing that you need to surrender to, to say yes to? What's that thing that you don't want anybody to know you can do because you know once they do, Pastor John's going to keep you accountable. He's going to make you do it. Or encourage you to do it. He won't make you do it. He's not that kind of guy. But it's time for you to have the courage to go for it. I'm amazed. Pastoring the church 32 years, I know people very well today. Very well. People that have been with us a long time, I've seen people come into the church just like you have. They come all down and discouraged and kind of bent over in their heart. You, don't, you know, kind of shy, not saying much, start getting set free from God's word. Before you know it, you start seeing parts of them you didn't see a year ago. Parts, more parts manifest two years later, three years later, four years later. You start realizing, I didn't know you played the bass. I didn't know you sang like an angel. I didn't know you could organize. I didn't know you were good at graphics. I didn't know you could build, you can build that. I didn't know you were good at, I didn't know you could do decorating. I didn't know you were a media guy. I didn't, all of a sudden, you start seeing, wow, these amazing gifts that the devil has robbed from us because of discouragement, because of self-doubt, because of fear, intimidation. Amen. What is it that we don't know about you that we knew, do need to know about you? We desperately need, and you desperately need to obey God. Courage. We all need it. Amen. We all have the capability of doing it, being involved with it putting the past behind us. Amen. At some point, what's done is done. Right? At some point, we realize it's done, and we step up, and we say yes to God, and we thank Him that, as we sang today, I love that chorus, there's just no turning back. The cross before me, right? What's it say? The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Let's stand to our feet. Did you learn something today? Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, raise your hands towards heaven today. Ah, oh, Jesus, we love you. You're so amazing. You're so good. Oh, we bless you and magnify you and thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We thank you for a manifestation of courage in our midst today. We pray for it. We can pray for boldness. We can pray for courage. We can't pray for more faith. That requires God's word and the study of it and the learning of it and the revelation of it. But Lord, we can pray for boldness. We can pray for courage. We can make a demand on courage. We can make a demand on the inside of us to rise up courageously today. Thank you, Lord God, that we make a demand on courage today. We thank you for courage. We believe for courage. We say we are courageous. We're not moved by fear. We're not moved by it. It's there, but we move forward in spite of it, in the midst of it, in the middle of fear. We rise up courageous. Hallelujah. We bless you and magnify you. Let's sing that song again, if you don't mind. Amen. I